So you're thinking about doing low carb or keto and you don't want to exercise. Hey, for that matter, it doesn't have to be keto or low carb. It could be the Orange, could be the Zone, could be Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers. But you're thinking you can do it just with a caloric deficit from food alone and not exercising. I got some information for you. You're going to enjoy this video. Hey team, it's Mike here at After 40 Fitness and After40Fitness.ca. <clears throat> Great question, comes up all the time and this week was no exception, saw no less than three times. Someone saying, hey, I wanna do keto or low carb, and again, it could apply to any diet regimen, but I really don't wanna exercise, is that okay? And you know the overwhelming response in social media? Go ahead, absolutely, knock yourself out, there's no need, and like 20 people will chime in and say, I lost 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 100 pounds with zero exercise, so, so of course you can do it. Uh, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna go right now, right on record, go for the juggler and tell you that is such a mistake and this video is gonna cover why. If this is your first time to my channel or you haven't yet, please do subscribe. Of course, smash that like button if you enjoyed any part of the content in this video. But do me a favor, hey, hit the bell icon, uh, select all for notifications. But if you know anyone who is doing some kind of a diet regimen and not exercising, this is a video you wanna share. Right? This is one of those ones that just throw the content at them, let them make their own decision, but I'm gonna give it to you straight because there's some things you need to know. All right, on that note, let's get after it. If you've been in the keto low carb space for any length of time, you've heard the phrase that the keto diet is muscle sparing or that ketones are muscle sparing. In fact, I'll throw up here a, a bit of a blurb on that to that same effect. In fact, you know something, every doctor and every keto guru in this space will talk about this. Thomas DeLauer, Dr. Berg, Dr. Berry, I'll talk about how ketones are muscle sparing. So notice here, a ketogenic diet, even though it's moderate in protein, can prevent muscle from breaking down through the magic of ketosis. Well, you should stop right there since you see magic. Uh, ketone bodies and especially beta-hydroxybutyrate are muscle sparing. So the question then is what is the definition of muscle sparing? Is it synonymous with muscle proof? And I often use this analogy. When you go buy a watch now, if you're a diver, a scuba diver like I am, uh, they no longer call them waterproof. You can't buy a waterproof watch anymore. They're water resistant. At some depth, you are going to get water in your watch, right? In the same way, are we saying that muscle sparing means muscle proof? I don't think so. That doesn't seem to be evidenced in, in science, never mind by the clinical research of doctors and scientists. Uh, so I actually looked up the definition of protein sparing. If notice, protein sparing is the process by which the body derives energy from sources other than protein. Protein sparing conserves muscle tissue. I like that word, conserves. The process by which the body derives energy from sources other than protein. Well, as soon as you look up the definition of gluco, gluconeogenesis, if you've ever heard that word gluconeogenesis, you know that that's impossible. You can't just say to the body, hey, I know you can use lactate, I know you can use the glycerol backbone of triglycerides, but I want you to not use amino acids. Tough luck, it happens. So I think we have a, to make sure we clear up this definition of muscle sparing and make sure you're clear in your head. It doesn't mean muscle proof, right? Muscle sparing means you'll lose less. Now I'm gonna start off with a quick quote. It takes about a minute to get through this little blurb by a guy named Dr. Osborne. And Dr. Brad Osborne is a clinical um, MD has a practice and he works with a lot of uh, athletes uh, as far as their medical needs goes. And one of the things he comments on is he has a lot of people on a ketogenic diet, a lot of athletes on a keto diet. So he sees firsthand with DEXA scans, et cetera, what their, the impact is to their muscle loss. Let's take a minute and see what he has to say. One of the problems with uh, ketosis, and this is not per the books, this is better than per the books. This is what I've seen and what I know to be true, okay? Knowing a lot of people who've been on ketogenic diets, et cetera, et cetera, is that when you are on these ketogenic diets, again, despite what people say, I can tell you what reality is, you tend to dump muscle, okay? You just do. Even though there's this muscle sparing effect of ketones, if you go and you look at somebody who's been on a, an aggressive ketogenic diet, they lost a lot of muscle. You can see yeah. the difference. They're going to lose muscle. You guys have seen it. Absolutely. We see it all the time. Experience okay. it. Of course. Yes. You, yeah, so you, <laughs> just, you, you just will. You just will. Even if you're using exogenous ketones and you're trying to play all these games and, oh, yeah, this is going to have a branch chains, et cetera, et cetera, you're, going to, you're still going to sacrifice some muscle. I promise you. I've seen it all the time. Take that with a grain of salt or take it at face value. But there is a doctor working with people in ketosis who sees muscle loss on, the, on a daily basis despite his help and his intervention. So let's start with a quick comparison. How much, if I'm right and muscle sparing just means less of a loss, less compared to what? Really good article here in Advances in Nutrition. You'll notice the title of this study was Preserving Healthy Muscle During Weight Loss. This was profound because it showed that weight loss, which is through any kind of a calorie reduced diet, which we all are on, I don't think there's very many people you would agree that are in a keto diet who are eating isocaloric, that they're eating at maintenance. We all 
all, I say that loosely, tend to go on a keto diet because it's the easiest way to establish a caloric deficit. And yet notice, decreases both fat and fat-free or lean body mass. Muscle fits in there, all right? Now, what I want you to get is the next line, notice that in persons with normal weight, the contribution of fat-free mass loss often exceeds 35% of total weight loss. So if up to 35% is lost, think about that for a second. If you're on the Ornish or the Atkins or the Zone, sorry, not Atkins, or the Zone, uh, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, and you drop 10 pounds, as much as three and a half of it is lean mass, whatever that means, but it definitely includes muscle. Notice the next line, in persons who are overweight or obese, they have a little bit of a muscle sparing effect on their own. A muscle sparing effect is by being obese, fat-free only contributes between, only, between 20 and 30% of weight loss. I like the line that men tend to lose more fat-free mass than women, especially after the initiation of weight loss, and that's probably because they tend to be leaner. So we're gonna give up more. Men are gonna give up more of the higher percentage of muscle in a caloric deficit. So how do we get around that? Well, there were, there were two suggestions given. One, regular physical activity, especially resistance type training. So again, can you, can you lose weight on a keto diet? Yes, if you can, it's un, unquestionable. You can lose weight. The question though is how much of that weight do you wanna be muscle? And if the answer should be, and I hope it is for you, I hope it's none, I hope, I don't, I hope you agree, you do not wanna lose any muscle. You just wanna lose water weight and or fat. Then resistance training, it's not an option. Can you, can you lose weight without exercising? Sure, but why do you want to? Why would you want to when this is the result? Second, notice higher protein intake, right? Somewhere in the area of 1.25 to 1.5 times the RDA and as much as, or at least, at least 1.5 times the RDA for those who exercise. So again, if you do the first half, if you do decide to exercise and in some way, shape or form, preferably resistance, preferably against weights, against bands, uh, something like that, then you're going to want to be 1.5 times the RDA. Now your question needs to be, what is the RDA? So you know the RDA right now, today, is 0.8 grams per kilogram of total body weight. Okay, that is the RDA. The RDA doesn't break down by lean mass or goal weight or whatever. It just says 0.8 times your weight. So <clears throat> if it's 0.8, let's call it for the Americans half of that, which is 0 0.4, 0 0.4 grams per pound of body weight. Okay, virtually nothing. This is where the 1.5 kicks in. If 1.5 is true, then you Americans should be at a minimum of 0.6 grams per pound, and us Canadians should be at least at 1.2 grams per, per kilogram. I want to rifle really quickly through two studies just to demonstrate the kind of muscle loss that can happen on a keto diet. This one here is a three-month ketogenic study on body composition, blood parameters, and performance metrics, and these were in trained CrossFitters. In this study, we sought to characterize the effects of 12 weeks of a ketogenic diet on body composition in participants who trained recreationally. You'll notice that they were divided into two groups, right? Into a control group and into a ketogenic diet for these 12 weeks. The DEXA scan, they use DEXAs here to, to look at individual muscle segments, and you'll notice that DEXA dual leg lean mass decreased in the keto group by 1.4%. However, their vastis lateralis the vastus lateralis is that big outer sweeping, I'll show a picture of it here uh, so you can see what I mean. It's the biggest part of our quadriceps, our biggest muscle group, and it decreased in the ketogenic group over three months, training right, over three months by 8%. Whew, 8%. The second study I'm gonna to refer to is here in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and it was the composition of weight loss during short-term weight reduction. In fact, they used 10-day periods just to see what, if they could notice what would happen in 10-day periods over ketogenic and non-ketogenic diets. And this example here, what they do is they broke down the losses by percentages. And you'll notice that composition of the weight lost during the ketogenic diet was 61% water, 35% fat, and 4% protein. So now here we go back to the, the definition of muscle sparing. Eh? If most diets for obese people are losing between 20 and 30%, of uh, lean mass in their loss, and as much as 35% in the first study we quoted, then you can see how protein, only dropping 4% of your body weight in protein, uh, is very, very muscle sparing. That's the definition of muscle sparing. It doesn't say 0%, so it's not muscle proof. Right? I think I've driven that, that point home. So I think you're probably convinced, right? You now understand there's a need to add some form of resistance training or conditioning exercises to your repertoire. Right, it's gotta be there. You cannot just want to create a caloric deficit just from food, just from calories. Right now, let me, let's face it, 
other than at least stopping the muscle loss, at least getting it down to zero, and potentially even adding a couple of ounces, right? adding some more mitochondria, adding some more powerhouses in your muscles, some more cells that are gonna burn, right? increase your metabolism, all bonuses of adding a couple of ounces, maybe even a pound a year of excess muscle. That's awesome, right? Congrats if that's your decision. But what about the other benefits? Let me rifle through three studies in a hurry to show you some of the other benefits, especially if you're older, right, over 40 or over 50 like I am, and or a woman. These studies, you're gonna love them. They're very intriguing about the other benefits that come from having a little bit extra muscle and or a little bit extra strength. I'm gonna draw your attention to this study. It's called a two-year supervised resistance training and how it prevented diabetes incidence in people with prediabetes. Right? A great controlled study. You're gonna like this one. The purpose of the study is to explore the long-term effects of aerobic training, AT, resistance training, RT, and the combination of the two on the prevention of type 2 diabetic incidence in patients with prediabetes, so insulin resistance. So, so these, these patients, these women were all overweight and or obese with insulin resistance, aka prediabetes, and now we're going to see the impact of resistance training, uh, aerobic training, and a combination of the two. Oh, this is so good. You're going to love it. Supervised exercise programs, including those three modalities, were completed for 60 minutes per day, three times a week, for the course of 24 months. What an awesome study. I love this. A, a total of 137 subjects with a mean age of 59. Get that. These are not spring chickens. And also twice as many women as men made up the 137 that completed the two-year analysis. So after 24 months, remember the, the purpose of this is to see how much their training impacted the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Those who did a combination of the two types of training of AT plus RT, so resistance training plus aerobic training, significantly decreased their incidence of type 2 diabetes by 74%. 74% versus the rest of the US Western, if you will, Western population. 65% to those who just did resistance training and 72% to those who just did aerobic training. You gotta fit in an hour three times a week, so profound. The second study we'll look at is in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. The title is Relative Muscle Mass is Inversely Associated with Insulin Resistance and Prediabetes. <laughs> here, I like this. The objective, oh, I love it, is to determine whether increases in muscle mass at average and above average levels are associated with improved glucose regulation. <sighs> Data from 13,000 subjects were evaluated. They looked at HOMA IR, so a measure of insulin resistance. They looked at hemoglobin levels. They looked at prediabetes and diabetes. The results are awesome. Each 10% increase in skeletal muscle index was associated with an 11% relative reduction in insulin resistance and a 12% relative reduction in diabetes mellitus prevalence. So phenomenal, the impact of a little bit of muscle across the full range, higher muscle mass relative to body size is associated with better insulin sensitivity and lower risk of diabetes. The most striking effect was in diabetes prevalence with relative reduction of 63%. Oh my God, let that sink in for a second. A 63% differential from the most muscular men and women in the study to the least muscular men and women in the study. Right? That's a phenomenal result. And so the, the summary is that per every 10% increase in skeletal muscle index, there was a 14% reduction in insulin resistance and a 23% relative reduction in diabetes. And notice the last takeaway, every kilogram or every two pounds for you Americans increment in muscle index was associated with a 4% relative reduction in insulin resistance, 0.3% relative reduction in HbA1c, and a 9% relative reduction in diabetes prevalence. Every kilogram. Remarkable. If you don't want to add a kilogram or two, I don't want to say other than please reconsider. That's crazy not to. The last study we'll look at today is in PLOS Medicine. Notice the title, Muscle Strengthening and Conditioning Activities and Risk of Type 2 Diabetes in Two Cohorts of U.S. Women. The method was to prospectively follow up with 99,000 middle-aged and older women. And this was over eight years based on two previous what were known as nurses' health studies that took 25 years each. So remarkable studies and they followed up with these almost 100,000 women. Participants reported weekly time spent on resistance exercise, lower intensity muscular conditioning, aka yoga, stretching, toning, and aerobic, both moderate and vigorous. 
You'll notice that during the 705,000 person years in the follow-up, there were th just short of 3,500 type 2 diabetes incidents. The pooled relative risk for type 2 diabetics, diabetes for women, and then it broke it down into amount of time spent per week in minutes. So someone who spent less than 30 minutes a week doing some form of exercise, 30 minutes to one hour, one hour to two and a half hours, and greater than two and a half hours over the course of the week in some form of muscle strengthening and or conditioning exercises. And you can see the percentages uh, compared to the relative risk of normal population of women who don't work out at all. What's profound is the last two. From one hour a week to two and a half hours, it was a 0.75%, so a 25% decrease in diabetes versus those women who don't work out, who didn't work out during the entire time period of this study. And greater than two and a half hours, it dropped further to 60% of the risk. In other words, a 40% reduction in risk of type two diabetes. Okay, the methods of findings, women who engage in at least two and a half hours of aerobic at, and at least 60 minutes of muscle strengthening exercise had substantial risk reduction compared to inactive women. And you'll see the pool again, it dropped by, 30, by, by a third. So a full third decrease in their chances of having type two diabetes. So all in all, I guess at the end of the day where I'm going with this is, never mind the fact that you do not want to lose muscle. You know you don't want to lose muscle, right? You want to at most maintain and prevent muscle loss while you're doing your ketogenic diet, but preferably add a pound or two. Why wouldn't you? It behooves you and it benefits you in so many ways. But as I've shown here, it helps you with glucose metabolism. Uh, the amount of muscle you have directly offsets insulin resistance, right? Muscles have to be insulin, insulin sensitive in order to use glucose and exercise is a direct contributor to that. But on top of that, your chances of getting diabetes are reduced. There are just too many benefits of working out for you to avoid it. So occasionally in a, in a forum, I'll mention something effective. Of course, you need to work out and someone will counter, you know, with that almost a moral high ground and say, you know something, when I get home from work, I want to focus on my family. I heard this a few times just lately that I want to focus on my family, that I've got four or five, six kids. And when I get home from work, my time is devoted to them. How short-sighted. Yeah, that's, you could call that taking the moral high ground and moral lecturing or whatever the right term is for that. But let's face it, taking care of yourself is always a priority. You at some point won't be able to. If you continue to lose muscle, your family will suffer because of it. Because you, honestly, you won't be around. You'll have diabetes. You'll have insulin resistance. You'll be able, and because of it, overweight and obese. So uh, we need to, and as you saw from this last study, as little as two and a half hours a week. If someone cannot prioritize two and a half hours per week, then they have other problems. Right? My job is just to bring you the science, give you my little spin on it, my take on it. But at the end of the day, asking you to, to uh, invest two and a half hours a week at a minimum, but two and a half hours per week to some form of conditioning and or strength, some combination of conditioning and strength exercise. Well, I just proved to you, you cannot afford not to. You will lose muscle otherwise, and it behooves you and I not to let that happen. On that note, folks, I hope you got some good stuff out of that. I hope you now made a decision that you are going to incorporate some form of resistance training and or conditioning in your repertoire, right, in your arsenal. Uh, and so listen, by the way, I should say, if, you, if anything I presented today causes you any concern, I am not a doctor. I'm a uh, yeah, I'm a certified keto coach and I'm also a personal trainer and boot camp uh, coach, but I'm not a doctor. So if I've said anything that causes you any concern, please do see your own family practitioner. And it's not meant in any way to diagnose, but just to give you some feedback based on the science and you can come up with your own interpretation just like I have. Please do put a comment in the comment section. As I've said, I'll turn the best comments into uh, videos just like this one and I'm happy to give you credit for the question. On that note, please do subscribe if you haven't yet. And if you do know anyone who's in a, a, a diet regimen of any kind, whether low carb or not, uh, and you know that they're not exercising, please do forward them this video. They need to see this information. They need to understand the risk to themselves, but also the benefits of including some resistance training and or some conditioning exercises.